Hi, and welcome to another episode of Piano TV. So today we are going to do the second part of our little two-part series on Baroque music. Just a little bit of a tour of music history so you can kind of get the gist of what was going on in the Baroque period and what was being innovated and what art was like and what music was like to better understand the Baroque pieces that you choose to play. So if you missed the first video, just click on the screen and you can watch that and then get all caught up. Because today what we are going to talk about is the development of tonality. We are going to talk about counterpoint and Bach and we are also going to talk about the rise of popularity of instrumental music. So let's hop to it. So tonality. This is something that we tend to take for granted because we just assume it's the way music is now, so it's the way music has always been, but that's not the case at all. Tonality came at the beginning of the Baroque era around 1600, and prior to that, we had something called modality, but let's, let's back up. I want to talk about what tonality is. Tonality is a musical system based on hierarchy, so what this means is that some keys are inherently more important than other keys. So if I say, I want you to play a C major scale or play a song that's in the key of C major, C major is tonality, that implies tonality. So if you're in the key of C major, the tonic, which would be C, is going to be the absolute most important tone in the entire key. So modes didn't work like that. Modality was a little bit more fluid. Let me give you a fancier definition of tonality just so you, you can store it away in the memory bank. So tonality is an organized system of tones, like a major or minor scale, kind of like we mentioned here, in which one tone, the tonic, becomes the central point of all the remaining tones. So in tonality, the tonic, like in our C major example, that would be C, is the tone of complete relaxation, or I like to call it the home note, same idea. The target tone towards which all other tones lead. We're not gonna to spend too much time discussing modal music because it's kind of crazy. It's like this whole other ballpark and I don't really use it in lessons to be honest. But the gist of modality is this. In modality, there are eight scales called modes and each of them have their own unique pattern of tones and semitones. So a tonal scale like C major scale or a tonal scale like D major scale have the exact same pattern of tones and semitones and they always sound the same. But every single mode sounds a little bit different because it has a different pattern of tones and semitones. So let's go to the keyboard and just take a quick look at that. To give you an example, the Dorian mode, which is one of the eight modes, would go something like this. So in the Dorian mode, the semitone occurs between two and three and six and seven. So here's semitone, semitone. So neither major or minor scales in our modern tonality have any patterns that resemble that. It's, it's kind of unique. So another different type of mode that we're going to look at is the Mixolydian mode. And I'll just show you what that looks like. Again, this pattern of tones and semitones isn't similar to what we use nowadays. Nowadays, this would be close to a G major scale. So in our modern tonality, G major scale would be this with a semitone falling between the seventh and the eighth note. So a mixolydian scale is almost like a weird hybrid between a major and a minor scale. And because of that, it has a very different sound. There are a lot of factors involved in the shift of music from modality to tonality. And again, it's a really, we could have like, you know, entire videos on that topic alone. But the gist of it is this, modal music was really well suited to vocal music and melodies. And that's mainly what music was throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. A lot of the times it would just be like, you know, even a cappella music or a single voice sung up like over top of a lute or something like that. But in order for music to become a little bit more complicated and for the intricate harmonies to start surfacing, we needed a new system that was able to adapt to that. So modality is no good for creating dense, rich harmonies because it's just, uh, again, without getting into like a huge, huge explanation, it's just so much easier within the structure of tonality to create harmonies when you have a key signature. I mean, that logic can be parallel to other aspects of the Baroque era, right? Because in the Baroque era, all other kinds of discoveries were being made. There were like huge scientific discoveries, which we've already talked about, like, you know, gravity or the discovery that we're not the center of the universe, stuff like that. We didn't really like that idea at the time, but you get my gist. There was this movement towards science and rationality and logic in the arts, 
and in like all fields of life. So it only makes sense that music would be heading in that direction too. And like I said earlier, music shifting to tonality opened up doors of complexity that would have never been possible if you were still stuck in the modes. That's not to say that modes are extinct. They're still used. I know a lot of guitar teachers teach modes and that's that's a thing. Um, crazy jazz music uses modes. Eastern music uses modes. So it is something if you're interested in, like it's, it's not like Latin, it still has meaning and relevance today. But considering like 99% of the songs you hear on the radio and most of the songs you're gonna attempt to play on the piano are based on tonality, let us celebrate that as being a huge innovation in music. So now let's shift our discussion over to counterpoint, which is an interesting topic because it's so different from modern music that it can sound like really bizarre to our, our modern ears. So what counterpoint is, it literally means point against point. And what this translates to in layman's terms is that it's when there's two or more melodies happening simultaneously. So the best way I can think of to show you this is with good old standard Mary Had a Little Lamb on the keyboard. So a modern way to play Mary Had a Little Lamb would be to play chords in the left hand, your accompaniment, and then the melody in the right hand like this. If I was a Baroque keyboard player though, I might play it in the style of say a simple invention using some of the principles of counterpoint. So these lines are independent. You could hear the left hand or the right hand by itself and it would still sound okay. It would sound like Mary had a little M. Whereas if I just played the chords and didn't play the melody, it can't really stand alone. It needs the melody to give it shape. So that's the big difference between Baroque invention, counterpoint, that kind of thing, and like modern accompaniment and melody. So here's an example as just a little simple invention. So you can hear how that sounds completely different, but if you focus on the left hand or the right hand, you can still hear that thread of the Merry Little had, had a Little M tune threading through. Counterpoint wasn't exactly a new concept in the Baroque era, but what it was is developed to its highest ultimate magical potential thanks to you guys like Bach, who basically perfected counterpoint. And part of the reason that counterpoint was able to get so complex and interesting and detailed is because of that shift to tonality, which we've just kind of talked about. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. We're gonna listen to a couple of examples of counterpoint by Bach just because I mean it's one thing for me to tell you that it's bizarre to modern ears and it's another thing entirely for you to like hear for yourself and decide what it sounds like to your own ears so we're gonna do that I just want to say too counterpoint is a major feature in almost all baroque keyboard music from like an early to intermediate to advanced basically like all levels of baroque music study and it's also the genre that I feel my students tend to be like the most unfamiliar with and the most tepid about like, eh, I could take or leave a minuet or a gavotte or like an invention or whatever. So I like to try to educate people in the ways of the Baroque, so that's a little more fun. But being able to understand Baroque music is, is completely critical to being able to understand it, just because again, it's so different from what we usually listen to, and we kind of need to like retrain our ears to be able to appreciate something that sounds so different. So we're gonna listen to a few seconds of Bach's first invention in C major, just so you can hear. This is a two-part invention, so we're gonna listen to a three-part invention in a minute, but let's start slow here. So there's gonna be a right-hand part and a left-hand part. Now, the tendency is for your ears to fixate on the higher sounding part, which would be the right hand. So what I urge you to try to do in this example is see if you can split your attention to the lower part and the higher part simultaneously. It's not easy, but it's very cool. Inventions aren't too crazy to listen to, right? You could probably focus on a little bit just because there is two voices. But this next example is gonna be a fugue which has three voices. And this is where counterpoint gets like really crazy and really complex. So we're gonna listen to his first fugue in C major, just a little bit of it. And what you're gonna hear is the theme, that's what we call like the main part. It's gonna enter in all by itself. 
And then there's going to be an echo of that theme a little while later in a different voice. And then finally, there's going to be like a third imitation of that theme that comes in. And it's really tough to pick the three of them apart when they're all happening at the same time. But it's really rewarding and really interesting. In the Baroque period, instrumental music became a genre in and of itself. So I find people are surprised by this sometimes because it's like instrumental music is another thing you take for granted. You just always assumed it was here. And it was always here, sort of. But instrumental music used to be more functional before the Baroque period. So say, for example, purely instrumental music would usually be used for dancing. And it wasn't necessarily something you just sit and listen to. But with the development of tonality and music becoming more complicated and more intense, instrumental music became like its own genre. Like people would just sit and listen to it and enjoy playing it for the fun of it. Another change from the Renaissance to the Baroque period was idiomatic writing. So basically what this means is in the Renaissance, music tended to just be like written as a catch-all. So there'd be like a sheet of music. So if you're playing the keyboard or the sham or the viol or whatever you're playing, you would look at the same sheet of music as the other musician, even though everyone has a different instrument. So idiomatic writing is when composers started writing music specifically for different instruments. So a violin, a violinist would play violin music, a pianist would play piano music, and so on. So that was a new and exciting thing. And in the process of these instruments getting a little bit more complex and having parts written specifically for them, we also had certain interests, certain instruments, sorry, die and like completely fall off the bandwagon in favor of new and more exciting instruments. So the old fashioned sham, which was like pretty quiet but like pretty was replaced by like the louder and more expressive oboe and then the violin swooped in and took over like the entire viol family as the main instrument again because it was very expressive and quite loud so yeah basically the louder and more expressive an instrument was the more it tended to be favored at the time because people liked their instruments sounding like they were imitating a human voice so now let's move over to keyboards. So harpsichords, you've probably heard them. They're really aggressive sounding, but they soared in popularity in the Baroque era because manufacturing was better and they were made higher quality and they sounded nicer. We also had clavichords, which were pretty popular. They were like for home use and they were like, they, they sounded really quiet. They were just like little tiny toy pianos basically. Now the harpsichord fell away at the end of the Baroque era in favor of the more modern sounding piano, which like all the in other instruments was more expressive and a little bit mellower. And then the organ was another very popular keyboard instrument. And this instrument was perfected by Bach, kind of like counterpoint. Bach was like, he perfected everything. And he created a huge body of organ work. But unfortunately, when Bach died, so did organ's popularity. And organ, again, fell away in popularity to the more exciting piano, which really started coming into its own in the classical era. But not really a thing. Bach like was known to fiddle around with pianos and stuff a little bit before he died at the end of the Baroque era, but they weren't really a popular thing at this time. And I just want to make a quick note about improvisation, because when we listen to Baroque music, a lot of the times we're like, oh, this sounds very like stodgy and formal and whatever. But Baroque musicians were known for their abilities to improvise. So you know that three-part fugue I showed you earlier by Bach? He would improvise fugues, which is just like mind-blowing. I don't know how you could possibly like concentrate on three things at once while you're playing. But yeah, improvisation was a strong thread and pretty much every musician was expected to be able to improvise complex music at the drop of a hat. So just kind of fun fact. And that concludes our discussion on Baroque music and music history and all that. So hopefully you've learned something and have a greater appreciation for the Baroque music that you do play. And we are going to do a couple Baroque songs in the near future here that we can work through. And hopefully this will give you like a deeper perspective into those songs when we do them. So thank you for watching this video. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it and subscribe if you haven't already and have a lovely day. That's not to say, oh, get out of there, cat. <laughs> you can't, she was trying to sleep on the computer.